this i think most of the people know what we call as five ways in quitting tobacco ask a person about tobacco use or ask him also about the harms that he knows of tobacco use and advise him to quit that is harmful it is going to affect you and not only you but your family also it will shorten your life uh, the premature death can occur as well there are several illnesses which can affect and one can then assess whether he or she is willing to quit and those who are willing to quit can also be then assisted to quit and their follow up can be arranged so that they do not get into the relapse this is called five ways for those who are not ready to quit on assessment they say i am not ready to quit which is there the case in the majority that is where you have to practice five hours five hours is that you need to know what is the relevance for this person if he is using tobacco or for the if he decides to quit what will be the relevance what are the risks does he know about the harms of tobacco use does he know about the rewards of tobacco use benefit of uh, quitting if he can know that if he knows this he knows risks he also can define the relevance then you need to know what are the roadblocks what are the challenges some people have examinations coming up some people have stress some people have some very important event in life where they do not want to suffer physically because of the withdrawal symptoms these are the roadblocks can i wait one can wait of course tobacco is uh, a substance which is causing the damage slowly in the body but accumulative damage that also you need to tell and so therefore those who are still not willing to quit we have to continue with them with the practice of 5 hours now how can you do that if somebody is ready to quit get him back to the assistance and make him quit but if somebody is not ready we need to end it positively the tobacco user is not a criminal that is what i tell my uh, wards that yes tobacco user is a patient tobacco use is a disease and on positive note that okay if you don't want to quit now come back again i am always available to help you for quitting maybe this is not right time you are thinking but we are always available keeping the door open i think is very important policy in practice of tobacco cessation if you don't have absolutely no time for delivering tobacco cessation what do you do you at least ask a patient about tobacco use document in the medical records of the patient advise tobacco users to quit quitting is the best for you you can also make it a strong comment that it can affect your life it can reduce your life and then refer this person those who are ready to quit and for those who are not ready to quit at least 5 hours but refer them somewhere to a tobacco cessation clinic to a national quit line to the m cessation program of the country ensure that the person has got into contact or has reached to these points this is very important if you just leave them in lurch which is happening most of the times and sometimes patients are responsible we call this as deception by the patient that they say no at that moment or they assure their doctor that i will quit immediately after going home i don't need treatment for it i think one has to be very careful about it but if you can't practice five a's practice two a's and r this is important these are two strategies there are many more i am not talking about this i am keeping it simple for a recall as well but these are two standard evidence based approaches that one can take in tobacco cessation managing tobacco cessation requires use of systems approach this is the best approach that one can have so that you don't forget anything you always have something integrated within the hospital system that is why it is called a systems approach what it is it has three phases screening of the patients for tobacco use treating them for tobacco use and then following up post treatment these are three phases and we'll discuss each one of this how do you screen the patients for tobacco use in india because majority uses tobacco uh chewing uh, to, uh, the chewable tobacco one has to ask the question little carefully do you currently smoke or chew tobacco and or pan masala how do you ask that in hindi i am more familiar with that kya aap tambaku khate peete hain that is very important because if you just say do you currently smoke and if he is just chewing tobacco he may say i don't smoke but if somebody is chewing tobacco and you say do you smoke he will still say no so you have to ask this phrase this question 
in such a manner that nothing gets excluded and person will be able to give you a more accurate answer. If he says, no, I don't use currently any of the tobacco or pan masala, then you need to find out also that is he a former user? Have you ever used it? People who have quitted successfully, we have seen through the Prashaska cycle that they also relapse. So it's very important to take note of this that former users can also relapse and we need to identify them in our screening process. If the hospital has uh, digitized its services, has a software for keeping a record, very good, but otherwise record it in the file that under screening, that whether the person is tobacco user, a smoker, chewer, or dual user, and or he has used it in the past. Now for those, uh, the second phase in systems approach is treatment. Treatment has two components or three components, one can say. One is counseling, primarily for changing the behavior, the psychological aspect of the illness that we correct through the counseling. And counseling is the long-term solution to uh, successful quitting or letting a person live life without tobacco. One has, as I told you earlier, it primarily means a change in behavior to eliminate the triggers the people with whom you are taking, the places with where you are taking tobacco and the times when you are tobacco, taking tobacco, you need to change the scenario completely. That you will not take tobacco when you are with the same people, when you are at the same place or in different times of the day because these are the things, triggers you can't change, the, the, the factors you can't change, but you can definitely eliminate these for tobacco use. Pharmacotherapy is the second aspect. We give medicines primarily to manage the withdrawal symptoms, which is the physiologic aspect of the treatment. And lastly, we should also take the help of uh, the effective tobacco control policies, which are already there in place through the National Tobacco Control Program. And one has to make the environment tobacco free. This is very important. We are working on it, uh, uh, on it through asking the state governments to develop the policies for vendor licensing. Unfortunately, vendor licensing lies under the uh, municipal corporation acts. And unless the state government decides, the task becomes difficult because then you have to go to every municipal corporation or municipal uh, municipality to get the rules changed, which is so very difficult, it's horrendous task. And the retailers don't like it. They are different groups of tobacco industry. So immediately the resistance comes that we will not take the license. And there are many bureaucrats and government uh, the politicians who do not want to let it happen. But if vendor licensing happens, you might have uh, recently observed the, the laws which New Zealand has brought, the anti, new anti-smoking laws. And one of their objectives, the law will get implemented next year. And by 2025, next two years, they want to reduce the number of retailers from 6,000 to 600 by 90%. So I think it's very important in our country also that tobacco doesn't become available everywhere, every nook and corner, every to everyone easily without any kind of identification. I think that is what needs to be changed. The counseling component, the categorization of type of counseling is based on the duration and intensity of the engagement with the tobacco user. So it can be a minimal intervention of two to three minutes on the usual rounds or in OPD where you come across a tobacco user. It can go a little longer where you talk to the patient a little about uh, the harms of tobacco use, the benefits of quitting tobacco, what pharmacotherapy you are going to give them, what is its use and what can happen to the person for, in case of relapse and when the relapses can occur, what requires to be done. That is brief intervention. And then one can have an intensive intervention of 30 to 40 minutes to an hour. This is, while the brief intervention is rather directive, uh, as a cognitive behavioral therapy, as we call it, which is primarily like a, a relationship between the school teacher and the student. You do this, you do that. These are the solutions which are available to you and you do it. But in intensive intervention through the motivational interviewing, we try and get the answers from the individual as to what is he going to do in this particular situation? What is he going to do if the, somebody comes to him uh, as a close friend who is also who has been smoking with him? Or what will he do when there is a lunch time and the colleagues are going out to a panwala for taking a puff? So there are different types. Uh, you have to find out 
uh, different skills you have to find out which skills will suit more to a person to eliminate such the triggers that he has. And that takes time. You have to bring the answer out of the people by keeping your questions as open-ended questions. You are not giving them a directive here, but you are trying to get the answers from them. It is more effective, definitely, but it is more time consuming. You have to be a little more expert in how you communicate with the patient. The process that I have been using is a combination of uh, a lot of uh, elements of all these three types of counselings. And uh, it's a 10-point agenda that I follow generally. I begin with rapport building, asking the name of the person, where from does he come, what does he do, what is his family background, etc. Then I ask him about the history of tobacco use. What kind of tobacco, what type of tobacco is he taking, for how long has he been taking, how frequently does he take it, and then does he require it within... 30 to 60 minutes of waking up and all that to know about the addiction status of the person. I also try and find out what does tobacco do to your body? Does it give you alertness? Does it give you stress? Biphasic uh, responses which are there, both may be there as well. And does the abstinence have any effect on it? There are people who can remain abstain for a day or two. And that's great. That's very helpful actually to know. But there are many people who will, as, uh, will not be able to abstain. 60% are addicts. So they are, uh, the abstinence of few hours can make them very restless due to craving or other issues. So we need to assess that. Then we also need to know, do they know about the harms? Most of the people know that tobacco causes cancer. Tobacco kills, that's fine. But do they know about myocardial infarction? Do they know about the stroke? Do they know about diabetes? Do they know about the respiratory disease it can cause, the 14 types of cancers it can cause, or whether it causes uh, the illnesses from head to toe, what other illnesses he causes, uh, the tobacco causes. So all that, the entire continuum of illnesses from head to toe, does he know about it? We spend some time on that, but larger time is spent on benefits of quitting because that is what is positive. We give them information as to how the quitting will benefit. How the equipment keeps uh, gives a cumulative effect of the benefits, which if somebody stays for 12 to 15 years, and if he's a young person, there is total elimination of the risk of tobacco use in that person. Then we ask them about the quit history, how many times he has quit in the past, or how long did could he quit, what happened, why did he relapse, what was the latest attempt of quitting, what happened as to why did he relapse again, so detailed quit history definitely helps. Person may have quit three, four times, five times. That is important. At least we know that this person is keen to stay tobacco free. And when he is quitting, what are the relapse, uh, what are the withdrawal symptoms that he has? What are the relapsing factors that he has? So it's easy to warn such people. Then we ask them where, whether he or she is ready to quit now. This I consider is the most important determinant in successful quitting. Those people who do not change their quit date once they have decided in tobacco suggestion cleaning, if they do not change, they are the most successful quitters. I always give them an analogy that like you cannot change your birthday, you cannot change your marriage anniversary. If you will not change the quit date, you will stay tobacco free throughout the life. And I tell them how to stay prepared to be to lead a tobacco free life, lifelong. That you don't buy tobacco, you don't, you can, you should always say no to somebody who offers it to you. You don't send somebody for buying tobacco for you. Or you don't stay in the environment where there is smoke, tobacco smoke, which is responsible for passive smoking. And then we also teach them skills to stay quit. This is the most important to eliminate the triggers. I'll talk about this again. We call it 7Ds. And then we talk about the relapse prevention. Now, what are the uh, what is the approach for the follow-up of such patients? Not many of these patients would come to you in the clinic or uh, telephonically. You have to follow them up telephonically. That's easy now. Most of the people have telephones, and you can. I at least do the six follow-ups of my tobacco. Uh, the patients whom I have treated for tobacco the, on the third day, on seven day, and then at the end of first month, third month six months and 12 months. These are the six follow-ups that I do, but there are many follow-ups in between 
for small calls that they may make or I may have to make because I find that this person is not very strong willed, his confidence level is low, or he has not responded on one of the scheduled calls. So you have to call him again to know where, what is the current status. The evidence suggests that the maximal success comes if you can make at least three calls, third day call, seven day call, and at the end of one month. But if you can make more calls, there is a slight change that you can have. So I consider making the calls, follow up calls at least up to six months is what is required for getting the maximal quit rate. What do we do when we do a follow up call? We greet the person, ask for his well being from other illness as well, and overall well being, ask him for the current tobacco use. If he's not sure, we ask him for the tobacco use in last seven days. If still unsure, in last 30 days. Most of the people speak honestly. Their response is very honest. They are very transparent. They will tell you, you better believe them because this is the evidence from Quitline that people don't lie. 95% of the time, you, they will give you the right answer. And therefore, we can categorize them every time through these types. Staying quit is within one month of quitting tobacco. Successful quitting is for successful quitting for one month or more, maybe lifetime. Failure to quit is that somebody is unable to quit after the initial counseling. No response is the category where a person has quitted tobacco, maybe at a variable period of time, then he stops attending to your calls. I make the call to them again in next 24 hours in 48 hours and then after seven days before labeling them as a non-responder. And then there are people who have successfully quitted, but they relapse again. So this is the categorization which is done. It's very important for assessing your results. So it's very important that we categorize the patients and make a record of it.